All right, so the first thing I had to say is I'll cover stack and queue, which is basically the last topic before the midterm. Then we move on to logical operations and opens up uh, more things for the third module where we'll start to look into how the program runs. Um, all right, what's the exact date for the midterm? Uh, one week from today in class in this room. All right. One week from today in class in this room. If you are sick, make sure you let me know. All right, so that we have the alternate option, especially if we have COVID or something that, that can be contagious because you don't want to make it spread in the room that bad. Uh, and I don't mind trying to accommodate it. All right, so please be aware uh, and please plan around that as well. Uh, now, as I said, we have to learn about two additional data structure that are super simple. Actually, it's even simpler than a link list. The queue and the stack, right? So queue, sometimes we call this first in, first out, because it operates as what humanity also known as a queue. You go into the queue, things are served in the order of arrival. Sometimes we call it first come, first serve, right? Any question about the definition of a queue? All right. If it's not clear, I'm not sure. Maybe you're not. if you're a good person, you should know how does a queue work. There are two operations: end queue, which means you insert something into the queue, and D queue, which is you take something out of the queue. And in a computer system, you can probably imagine that so many queue involved. For example, you want to send the data from one place to another. You can send the data into the queue. So that the receiving end process the incoming data in the order of arrival. The implementation of a queue, uh, we will cover two things. We can use an array. We can also use a linked list. But to be honest, you can use whatever data structure that suits your needs, right? So let's say if you want to use an array. What's one of the restrictions with the array? Yes, it can only have one data type. It can also only support a certain size, right? So if I have an array of size 10, means that your queue can hold up to 10 things. But that's also a simplified thing. Do you have to use the linked list to support this? No, it's just an array, it's simple, right? And the only thing you have to remember is inside the array, right? Where is the front of the queue? And where's the back of your queue? It's as simple as that. You have two variables, right? That, that's a number for the front and the back. So in this case, front is going to be number what? Number two, right? Array start from zero, zero, one, two. So it knows that the sec, like the, 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 the third element, right? Number two is the third element in your array. That's the front of your queue. When you want to end queue, Basically, let's say you want to end queue number X into the queue. Basically, you want to basically put X in here, right? One thing you can do is let's say this is called AR. You can say ARR of plus plus X uh, plus plus back equal X, right? You increment back to the new location, then you add X to that location. Then one more thing is the edge case, right? If back is at the end, then you need to make sure it wraps around to the front. So you will have another if else to say, hey, if back is pointing at the last location, because then the next MC spot is at front. So that's NQ. DQ is a similar, we follow similar logic, but now you take things from the front, you return, this element, right? And then you increment front one step. Now, usually when you implement the array, there are two more things. Some, something like a get size, right? How many elements do I have in my array right now? There are two easy things you can do about this. First, you can maintain another variable called size and just return that. When you enqueue, you do size plus one. 
when you DQ, you de decrement side. So that's one easy way you can do that. Another easy way you can look at front and back and see how far they are from each other. If back is greater than front, front right, the size is the difference because the items in there will be the difference of the two things. Right now, the other thing is, is empty and also is full. These are of, again relative to front and back. Some implementation will have back pointing at the first empty location. Some in, uh, some implementation have the back pointing at the last item. I mean, they work the same way, right? It's just a matter of how you would like to implement them. Um, and if empty is full, we'll follow that logic, right? So that's the array implementation. Again, if you have the internal variable called size, also this will simplify if empty and is full. If size is zero, empty. If size is the size of your array, full. Okay. Uh, so these are design choices. So that's how you can use array to implement your skill. Any questions so far? Great question. So in C, it will be zero for false, non zero for true. Usually it would be paired up with an if else, basically if is empty or if is full, right? Uh, usually it also pair up with NQ and DQ because you can't add anything if it's full. And you can't take anything out if the queue is empty. So we'll use for DQ check if it's empty. If it's not empty, you can check things out. If it's empty, some weird thing happened. If you want to add something in queue new item to the queue, check if it's full. If it's full, don't add them. And you have the way to handle that. You keep checking and then eventually add that, or do you choose to discard it and not adding this, right? depending on what you need the queue for. Another possible implementation is you can use linked list for this. Yeah, this allows you to have a queue of any size, right? Uh, in this case, NQ, Add something at the front or add something at the end. Just be consistent. If you want to add things at the end, when you remove things, remove from the front. And that's it. Right? Okay. So it, yes. How would you use it in the end? Find like how many others? Well, if it's empty, it's going to be now, but there's no full. Because you can always add more things. All right? So if front point to now, that's empty. Yes. So for the linked list implementation, we would assume that if you need a linked list for a queue, it's also implicitly assumed that you you want your queue to be infinitely long or can grow. Basically, it's like you don't have the fixed size for your queue. One thing I, I can tell you: which one is easier to work with? Uh, actually, I have to be more explicit in how I ask them. Array is easier in terms of complexity because if you know front and back to access them, you can go there right away. You don't have to go through your entire list to add something in. So in this case, actually, array is generally almost on half is faster, right? So in in modern day computing, you'll see that queue will be implemented with an array because you also the other thing is you don't in many cases you don't want your queue to be infinitely long because most of the time, these are big, these queue will be constrained by things like how much memory do you have, right? If you allow your queue to be infinitely long or like some huge queue, um, you might run out of memory or you might run into the case where uh, the resource is much more constrained because the queue is big. Because that, like you, more of the time you use queue and stack as a buffering area for like temporarily variable or data to pass in and out from one command to another and things like that, right? So in many cases, they just make the queue to be an array with the size that's big enough, and that's it. Uh, so that's, that's the queue. The second type of data structure is the stack. The stack 
use the last in first out discipline, the way I would compare this is like, you see like Pringle box, right? When you go to the supermarket and you buy like Pringles and, and like some, any, any snack that has a box that's like typed like this, you put thing in, that would be the last thing that come out. Whatever is in the front or the top that come out first, right? There are two operations, push and top. Push mean I add thing to my stack. Top mean I take thing out of my stack. And again, implementation, you can use, oops, sorry. You can use an array, right? In this case, your stack, the easiest thing you can do is it grow from the first element. So if the first element has like nothing, it's empty, then you have a variable called top. When you want to add something, you increment top, you add it there. If you want to take something out, you deck, uh, you, you return where top is pointing and then you decrement top. In that case, if top point to say a negative one, it means the stack is empty because top basically point to like the location that doesn't exist. If top point to zero, it means that that's one item in my stack. I can return them and the stack become empty. If I push, I increment from zero to one, add one thing to that and, and basically update the stack. All right. This is actually even simpler to implement compared to a queue because I mean push and pop are simple. It's only deal with top. Is full means is top is at the size of your array. Is empty is top at, at depending on your implementation is either at negative one or zero. Sometimes people would just say top will point to the first empty location. In that case, top is going to be zero. Okay. You also can use a linked list for this. And the way it works, same way, but now instead of insert at the end, remove at the front, in this case, insert and removal happen at the same place. It can be insert at the front, remove at the front, or insert at the end, remove at the end. Which one is simpler? Which one is more efficient? In the case of linked list we learned so far, Actually, I'll ask you, which one is the better choice? Should I insert at the front, remove at the front, or at the back? Which one will make you do less work? If I want to insert at the end, I have, it means I have to go to the end first, right, before I insert. If I remove and insert at the front, I don't have to do anything. I know where I'm inserting. I just put it at the front, and that's it. So doing at the front, if your list in that case is built in the way we learned in class, it's more efficient. Because you don't have to go through your list to insert and delete, you, you have front already, right? So you just deal with that. Now, uh, any questions so far? <laughs> there might be one on your, on your assignment three. I mean, think about it this way, uh, the, the, the data structure that involves pointer that you guys learned so far, link list, queue, and stack. I need to pick some. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so here is your cutoff for your midterm. It doesn't include this one. This go to the rest of your midterm to the final. All right. So what I talked so far is the content for your midterm and that's it. Now, the next thing we have to talk about is to switch here a little bit is binary operator, right? So how do you add two binary numbers? Yeah, by hand. Just, yeah, align align them up, right, and add each digit. It's similar to how you would add a, a like a ten base number, right? Because if you if you think about it this way, right, number four four hundred fifty six in decimal is basically four multiplied by ten to the two plus five multiplied by ten to the one plus six multiplied by ten to the zero, right? 
And if I want to add this with 34, for example, this is basically 3 multiplied by 10 to the 1 plus 4 multiplied by 10 to the 0. The reason why you first need to align the digit because the base will align. Aligning the digit makes sure that the digit that is tied to, let's say, in this case, 10 to the 0 or 10 to the 1 is aligned. So you can add the pair here and here and here. When you have a carry, for example, this is like 10 multiplied by 10 to the 0, right? Any carry, so let's say you have the number 12, right? You can convert this to 10 plus 2 multiplied by 10 to the n. This is 1 multiplied by n plus 1 plus 2 multiplied to the n. Carry essentially becomes 10 to the whatever plus 1. That's why when we have a carry, we add to the next digit. The way the work, the way it works in binary, same logic. The way it works in hexadecimal, same logic. If I want to do something like this, A, B, C plus one, two, three in hexadecimal, right? I just add A and one, multiply by 16 to the two plus B and two, right? Multiply by 16 to the one plus C and 3. Multiply by 16 to the theorem. Whatever that number is, because I don't want to do that calculation. Well, actually, we can do it. This is B, this is D, and C, and F. If you add them together, you add digit by digit C plus 3, C, C, E, F. So that's F, B, C, D. So that's D, A, B, right? So you get D, D, F as a result of your addition. So you can apply the same trick as whatever you learned back in your primary school for the decimal number on any base, base 8, base 2, base 16, base 13, whatever base, it will work because math works. It follows math, right? It follows how the math, you can group this multiplication, make sure you align the base, then add them together. Group up the 10 to the 1, 10 to the 0, 10 to the 2. Now, other operations, subtract, right? A plus B, right? Oh, sorry, my bad. A minus B is A plus negative B. If you can do an add that deal with the negative number, the way it works, same way. Align the digit, but instead of adding, you subtract it, all right? Multiply with base 16 or base 2 works the same way as decimal. If you can multiply number in decimal number, it works the same way. It works the same way. All right. Any questions so far? So I just want to do a quick recap on that. Like add or multiply and whatever. Yeah, sure. Let's say I want to do this. 101 multiplied by 1100. So this is 5 multiplied by 1 plus 8 plus 4 is 12, right? I should get 60 as a result. So let's confirm that. So I would do 101 multiplied by 1100. The way I would do it is like a simple primary school multiply, or I guess it's like primary school, middle school multiply. 00101. 0, 0, 0, 1, oh, 1, right? The, the same way you would like handle multiply. So that becomes 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. Sorry about the misalign a little bit here. This is what? It's 4 plus 8 plus 16 plus 32. This is 48. This is 12. You add them up, you get 50. All right? So the way multiply works, as I said, works the same way. Simple. Okay. Hexadecimal number, yeah, it's the same thing. You just shift the base and then multiply the actual like base 16 to the top number. Right? So the same logic. So Boolean algebra is what might be quite new for you guys. Okay. The basic is this. We can represent the algebraic representation of logic 
For example, I can say, I want to say it's sunny today and I look out, it's not exactly sunny. So I should not use that example. I can say, we have the lights turned on here. That's a true statement, right? I can say, but in the back, the light is off. That's also true. And I can give you a lie and say, hey, the light's not on. In that case, it's a false, right? You can represent this logical reasoning or any logic with zero and one. Zero is false, one is true. Okay. There's this thing also, this is called the truth table. I'm not sure if you've seen this already or not, but the truth table is the table that represents our possible result of the, the Boolean algebra, even the input. Hmm? It's just yeah. Well, you can use the truth table to simplify your logic game, essentially. The way it works is, Let's say you have the and or not like these logic, these these logical operation, right? I can say I can say a and b. It means that a has to be true, b also has to be true for the whole thing to be true. So let's say I want to create the truth table for a and b or c. That is going to be my truth table. The way I would do this is I expand all the possibility. A can be true, a can be false. B can be true, B can be false, C can be true, C can be false. Then the, the reason why I said this, well, the reason why we name it the truth table is like this, think of it this way, it's like a lie detector. For this whole thing, A and B or C, right? A and B or C, it will be true. This, the first case is true. The second case is true. The third case is also true. The fourth case is false, right? Now here is true, this is false, this is true, this is false. Basically, now you have the way to tell whether this whole logic A and B or C is true or false given the input. Given the input, given our possibility of your input. Given our the possibility of your input. All right. Now, that's the definition of true table. The reason why we expand on this topic just a little bit because if you basically do computer engineering and you go into the more like a digital design logic design that's needed for the simple logic modern day computer when you build the hardware there's a program to, to do this for you because at the end of the day your logic gets really big and you don't want to build a giant table for like a really really expansive logic all right but Fundamentally, it works this way. Boolean algebra is a little bit different. Now, Boolean algebra, so let's say I have a number in C language, right? I say in I equal five, in J equal 10. Boolean algebra dictate what would happen if I do I and J. This I and J is different from I and and J. I and and J is logical operation. If I is true, J is true, which basically means that in C, anything zero is false, anything non-zero is true. So if I is non-zero, J is non-zero, that whole thing is a true statement. So that logical operation. So now here, Boolean algebra in C is I and J. It first treat I as the binary number 101, J is 1010. And it performs a pairwise and. So 1 and 0 is what? 1, 0 and 1, here is 0. 1 and 0 is 0. This is also 0 and 1, 0. So 5 and 10 become 0 because it aligns all the binary of 5 and 10 to form the pairwise operation. Let's say I want to do 5 and 4. 5 is, again, 101. 4 is 1, 0, 0, right? 5 and 4 is what? Yeah. 
if I do a pairwise and what do I get? One zero zero in binary, which is what number? Yeah. That becomes four. Okay. So in this case, operations are done by treating your binary number as a vector of zero and one. Then you apply the operation bitwise for each bit. So these are the operators that are available in C. This is not. So not of five, which is not of binary 101 becomes like you flip the one to zero, zero to one. And let's say if this is eight bit kind of thing, so you're gonna get one, 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 zero, one, zero. All right. This is and so every single bit when you do A and B, you align all the bits and do the and for each each pair. This is or this is exclusive or the way exclusive or work is zero exclusive or zero is zero. Zero exclusive or is uh here. This is almost like an OR operator, except if the number are the same, that's zero. That's why we call it exclusive OR. There has to be an, like a unique one and zero that the only case is true. The last one becomes, sorry, one exclusive OR one is zero, okay? Uh, it has to do with the word exclusive. I want to or this thing, but only if one is true. Only if one of them is true. This is different than the logical operator, like the, the not with the bang sign or the double and double or. All right. Why do we learn all this thing? Because it's actually, we use this quite a lot to make operation faster. So there are tricks you can do with this concept. For example, for example, let's say you have to have to do it. Let's say you have to run a program and that program has to maintain a set. So what's the mathematical definition of a set? It includes some items, right? And you have the operator like, do I have this? Do I have this? And you can do union. You can do intersection. Right. Intersection means that of the two set means what's that, what are the repeated elements. Union of the two set is you combine all the elements together to create the new set, right? So let's say you have to maintain a set of number from zero to eight. Now let's say zero to 15. You want to maintain a set of number from zero to 15. One thing I can do is I can use what? A linked list, right? If I have a number, say one, three, five, I'll have a linked list that say one, three, five. What if I have to do union of a two set? You have two linked lists, right? And you just merge them, which is pretty easy. You go to the end of the first list, make sure it points to the beginning of the second list, you're done. Then you might have to make sure there's no repeated element, if you will. For example, if the first set is one, two, five, the second set is one, four, your result should be one, two, four, and five. Right? In that case, how do you detect that? There are two ones here and you get rid of it. You can also skip it if you want, depending on how you implement this, right? Now, another separate method is, I would say this, I would maintain a six, uh, 16 bit number. How many bits, uh, how many bytes is 16 bit? Two bytes, right? For each bit here, for each bit here, if that's a number one, it means that that particular number exists in my set. For example, in this case, I only have three ones in here, right? 
That's one at position zero, one at position two, and one at position three. It means that my set consists of the number zero, two, and three. As simple as that, I maintain a two byte short integer, but if the bit that correspond to that position is a zero, it means my set does, does not have that number. If the bit that correspond to say position n is one, my set has the number n in it. All right, so now, Let's do another set with let's say zero 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 one 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 zero zero. So what's this set? Three, four, and five, right? If you if you use the same definition. The one position is at position three, four, and five. It means that my set has number three, four, and five. All right, how do I do the union? With one action, right? Let's say this is A, this is B. What if I do A or B? Okay, let's let's do it. Here, right? A or B is going to look like what? One, right? Because the first position is one or zero. Yeah. So this becomes what? Zero, two, three, four, and five. With one operator, the OR operator, I got the union, right? If I do A and B, what do I have? A and B will pick only if both of them have the number one. So what is that? Number one means I have that number in my set. I will get three as a result, right? It's the intersection operation. So in that case, in the fact, if you use a list, what do you have to do? For each item in the list for set A, compare if they have that in set B, that's a lot of comparison. You have to like go through your list multiple times, right? In this case, one action, you're done. Imagine you have a eight byte long integer. That's how many bits? 64, right? It means that if your set if within 0 to 63, you can implement it using this method. And you can do union quickly, you can do intersection quickly, and you can use struct, if you will, right, to extend this to whatever size you want. So in many optimizations, somehow we would implement the set this way. Bit value, one means that the number is there, zero means it's not there, and become intersection or become union, X or become symmetric differences. It means that I want to check for elements that doesn't exist in both sets. The not become the complement, complement of my set, right? So this allows you to quickly do a set operation. Uh, if your set is not big enough, this is really useful. In modern day, sometimes your day is way too big, so sometimes this is not useful anymore. Sometimes your set consists of the number between one and one million, but there's only like five items in there. You don't want to do this. So then your, your data will have to have bit zero to bit one million, but there'll be like just a few ones in there depending on your input, but this can be really useful as well. It's a useful optimization. Now, shifting, shifting has two formats, logical shift. Basically, you shifting as is. That's shift left and shift right. So if I have a number 101 and I want to shift to the right by two, and if this is a logical shift, if this is a logical shift, you basically push everything to the right by two, two positions. If it go over, throw it away. So in this case, what's the result? One, all right? 
arithmetic shelf, you preserve the most significant bit. For example, if your number is a negative number, let's say this is a negative number, this is start with a one, and that's like the most significant bit, all right? If I have to do shift right by two, you, you do almost the same thing, but to the left, you keep adding one. So you keep adding one to here. So in this case, it becomes one, one, and then you use the same number. One, zero, one, one, zero, 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 one. And then the last zero and one get pushed over, and that's it. That becomes your new number, okay? Wait, what? What do you mean? Like, you, what if you do this, right? Is that your question? Yeah, like, what is the zero at the start? Like, for the example, you get. Like this? There's no one there. Wait, here. Nothing. Zero. Oh, here, right? Yeah. So it basically shifts everything to the right, so it becomes one zero. Uh, yeah, one zero. So if there's a sign bit, basically the key here is for arithmetic shift. If there is a sign bit, which is one, you keep adding one to the sign bit position. If the the sign bit is zero, you keep adding the zero to the position, which means nothing, right? So you, you append the sign bit whenever you have to shift to the left or right. If you shift to the left, in this case, like if you do shift left, right, you also maintain the sign bit. You keep the sign bit as a separate thing. You push everything else to the left. Now, uh, let's move on to the more complex operation that you can do. Like that trick they can do now that you know this logical operation. Let's start with the easy one. We'll do a quick break afterwards. But now let's first start with negation, right? Negation is the simplest. Negative number, let negative five equals to not five plus one. The reason why we can do this is because of the two complement format. The two complement format allow you when you do the negation, it will be just the opposite in terms of the absolute value. Like you go to the other side, if it's positive, you go to the negative. If you are negative, you go to the positive side. But the difference of the value will be one. Then you have you just need to add one to that. You get the same number back, but it's a negative number back. So we use this a lot in computer and computer design. Why is that the case? It means I can implement the logic A minus B with an adder. If I know how to add things, I can do, do A plus not B plus one because that's negative B, right? I can reuse the adder to do a, a sub, subtraction. Okay, any questions so far? Now, for addition, uh, if you add two unsigned number, if you add two unsigned number, you just add them normally, and it might overflow and it would get thrown away. Any overflow number gets thrown away. If your number is a short integer, which is two bytes, after you add them, you like you have to carry into the seventeenth bit, throw them away. Sign addition. Work the same way as unsigned. You just add the binary number, but you keep the sign bit. You keep the sign bit. Basically, if A and B are int sign integer, it's the same as convert A to unsigned, convert B to unsigned, add them, then convert all the result back to a sign integer. This will be the same as A plus B. All right. There are also this thing called true sum, true addition. What it means is, let's say I add two number, and I have a carry bit that overflow, that overflow, and I have to throw it away because 
my short n that is the point the 17 bit i will have to write some machine like an arm architecture or intel architecture will have the special register that store the information that hey you're adding two number and it did overflow we will call this the overflow bit if you have an add operation that overflow the computer actually detects it for you why is this useful actually it would tell the user hey hey you add two numbers and your result is going to be wrong because you overflow uh subtraction if you know how to negate as i said right you know how to subtract a minus b becomes a plus b not plus one so it's not b plus one that's minus b all right now this is another handy trick multiply by the power of two this is actually easy when you have shifting why do we do this multiply take a lot more time than adding and shifting in the computer take quite a bit longer so if we can avoid doing multiply by just doing the shifting you're good we gain performance okay so left shift for example uh, if i have the number a i want to multiply a by four this is the same as left shift by two a multiplied by two to the n is the same as a left shift by n the formula is exactly this and why does it work if you shift anything to the left by one bit it basically means that you add the zero to the end of your number right adding zero to the end is as if you multiply every single digit by two so if you have to shift two bits, it means you add zero to the end twice. It means you multiply every single thing by two, then by two or by four. If you have to shift by n bits, it means as if you have to multiply by two to the n. You multiply by two n times that two to the n. Okay. You can also use the same logic here. To do divide by power of two but if shift left is multiplied by two shift right is divided by two so over here a divided by four is the same as a shift to the right by two a divided by two to the n is the same as a shift right by n great question uh so this work with a positive number this also will work if you use the arithmetic shift and make sure you keep the if you keep the sign bit so basically let's say a is like one zero zero two one zero and let's say this is the sign bit all right you shift everything to the right what happened you get one one uh, let's do shift by two right one 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 zero 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 one one zero one that's the result it should still represent the number you want to represent divide by four or two to two left shift in this case uh, should work as well basically keep the sign bit the rest is shifting because if you think about it right anything that's not a sign bit those are a positive thing you're adding to your sum right if you left shift to the right it means that you multiply whatever that positive part of your number by two to the end right into the your your, your whole sum yeah mm -hmm. oh depending how many bits you can hold eight bits then eight bits essentially you can represent zero to 255 right the range when you have the negative number becomes half of that because half will have to be the negative side the other half will be the positive side because you also have to represent zero the negative side will start from negative one to say negative 128 the positive side becomes zero to 127 yeah so that's always the range uh you divide things by half zero always go with the positive side just to remember it's like easier to remember that thing all right 
Now, if you multiply two numbers, okay, this is almost the same as adding. We can have carry, but multiply is even more aggressive because if you have two n bit number, you multiply two n bit number, you get two n bit at the end, which can easily overflow, right? Which can easily overflow. So if it overflows, the computer get rid of that. So that the key point, the key takeaway here is if you have two numbers, you want to multiply them together, make sure you, your result have the data size that are big enough that fits. That fits. Otherwise, you get a wrong result. So I mean, we have four bytes and we do 10 multiply. So we multiply. That is bigger than the byte. I mean, it could be in the test 32, uh, 32 bytes, right, at the end. Uh, 40, uh, 40 bytes actually, 10 multiplied. Like you have four bytes number. Each time you multiply, it can go up to 2n, right? So you can go from 4 to 8 to 12 to 16, blah, 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 blah. So in that case, there are two things you want to ensure. You want to first ensure that your result will fit within whatever the new data size that you want to practice. So here's about bit manipulation and why it's quite important to building a computer, right? Every single combinational logic, which also include like addition, subtraction, multiplication, can be represented using a uh, sorry, and or and not. And or and not. It means that if I have a way to build an AND gate in electronic like and get mean if I have a high voltage right high voltage as an input and get can be drawn using this like half circle sign if they are both high voltage it should output high voltage otherwise it should be low voltage that's it electronically I just need that if input is 1.5 volt in both input I should get 1.5 volt at the end Otherwise, if input is 1.5 volt at one input, zero volt, which is number zero, I should get zero volt at the end. If I can build that, it means I have an AND gate. Then if I can also build the same thing, but for the OR gate, if it's 1.5 volt anywhere, output is 1.5 volt, unless both input has zero volts coming in, zero volt at the end. Or a NOT gate, 1.5 coming in, you get zero. Zero coming in, you get 1.5 in word, the signal. It means I can build any single math operation in the world. Your program is essentially a bunch of function calls. Functions are math operations. It means I can build a computer. So with this assumption, it's a really, really powerful assumption because if we can build AND gate, OR gate, NOT gate, we have a computer. All right. That's why this is important. The second thing is the meaning in hardware is this. Well, the ability to build three things that's annoying. It means that if I want to build a computer, my factory has to build three different gates. All right. Can we go with one? Can we go with one? Now, the thing is, if you have a not and, it basically means that. If you have a AND gate, right? A NOT AND will have the negation at the end. So if you have the normal AND operation, you flip the result. You better flip the result. So in this case, it should be a low voltage. If I have only the NAND gate, I can build an AND gate out of a NAND gate by, well, first I can do a NOT gate out of the NAND gate. Then I can build the and an or gate using my not get and an and get. So basically the, the key is I can build every single logic with just a NAND gate. If I cannot produce a NAND gate, then I can also use a no gate, not or work the same way. Work the same way. So if I can build the factory that can just mass produce NAND gate, I can build a computer. 
the other way around, let's say there's a new technology coming out, nor gate is way cheaper. Then I can build a factory that can just produce no gate, also have a computer. All right. So this allows human to basically build a CPU and your mainboard and your computer. Um, what does this really mean for you is with this as well, right? When you write a program, rather than expensive operation like multiply, division, division is actually way worse than multiply. Division is like really, really expensive. If you can replace those things with logical operator like and or not, your program essentially becomes a lot faster. A lot faster. How much shifting about the floating point? With floating point. Uh it does not. <laughs> does not. You can actually write another function to wrap it up to make sure shift in floating point. Well, we can work as modified by two or two to the n because what you did, the only thing you have to do change the exponent bit. Right, that would become modified by two to the n. Yes, yeah, question. How would you divide? Oh, uh, I need to look it up because it's quite complicated. <laughs> so, for the multiply, you can imagine I can even have. Adder, right? If I can add two things, I can multiply. Uh, basically, that becomes like add and shift, add and shift, add and shift, right? Uh, division, I, I forgot, so I need to look it up. Sorry about that, but if, if you want to, I can follow through and, and post the link on uh, Discord. Yeah. So, some, ex some example of this. Let's say I have an array of integer where inside the array, Right. Each integer has its own pair. For example, my array can be something like this. One, two, seven, seven. Right. In this case, two has its pair, seven has its pair, but one doesn't have the pair. Can I quickly go through this once only? And then I find that the number is one using logical operations. This is a quick brain teaser, to be honest, because this, to be honest for me, unless you know the answer already, it would take some time to think about this. It's like brain teaser kind of question. Um, you can. You can do two for loop. Start from one number and see if there's a pair, then move on to the next number and see if there's a pair. But can we do that with just one for loop, going, all, like going once and that's it? All right, quick hint, XOR. So let's take a quick break. Uh, I will come back after the, like basically we'll, we'll be back uh, after 10 minutes break, I'll tell you the answer. All right, uh, so yeah, that's basically it for the class today. I want you to do two things. Finish up the in class exercise if you haven't done so. If you have done so, check the sample midterm. See if you have any questions. All right. The what? The uh -huh. Oh, the GitHub question from term one. If I remember correctly, uh, wait, what do you want? Like, there are some special options you can put in to get exactly just that. Should be pretty quick. Dash B. Get branch to dash B. Yeah. So if you already clone, you can do git branch. Uh, git check out the dash B would check out that branch. Uh, if you haven't cloned, you first clone to the to get the master branch, then do git check out with the option to go to that branch. That works too. So I so to be honest, I forgot the exact thing I want to do for that question. But if I remember correctly, it's like switch to branch X or something. 